Good evening and welcome to Kunsang Payal Chuling. Uh, tonight's teaching by Jetsama Akanamo is uh, entitled Vajrayana's Final Hour. And it was given in February of 1992. So that was the original teaching. And unfortunately, it's still relevant today. So we um, will begin now. We can learn Dharma literally for years. Really, we can learn it and learn it and learn it, and we can be able to list things. We can list things that turn the mind. We can list the, the uh, Four Noble Truths. We can list the Eightfold Path. We can just list and list, and we can carry on and learn things by rote. But when it comes down to the simple insight of knowing what you should do if you see sentient beings suffering, kids have it all over on us. They know what to do. They understand it in that simple way, at that easy level. And it really changes their lives. And I think the reason why that happens is because they are much more free of doubt than we are. You know, we are, uh, it's uh, the karma of our mind is, is that we are so filled with doubt. And that doubt is, is very complicated. Um, it's based on the idea that we are important and significant and meaningful and we are who we are because we can think and we can discern and we can criticize and we can, can judge and uh, unfortunately, we uh, don't only reserve that kind of thinking and, and uh, judgment for the appropriate time. Sometimes we think that what we should do is to reserve judgment for the Buddhist teaching, which from the point of view of being a sentient being is kind of silly in that we could never have, we do, we do not have the same wisdom that the enlightened ones have. Uh, we do not have the same understanding that they have. Our minds are not as clear as the children indicated. Our minds are not as clear. <laughs> We have ordinary perception. We are ordinary sentient beings. Therefore, uh, we should do as the children do when we are told to be kind because the Buddha teaches us that is the antidote to suffering. We should simply, without doubt, without holding uh, court within our minds, we should be kind. That simple. Try to be kind. You know, try to, to change the habit of our self-absorption and our selfishness. It's amazing how children can just do that without doubt. They can just, in a very natural and clear way, get on it. And uh, I enjoy teaching the, t the children for that way. Even though they're distracted, even though they can be noisy, even though they, uh, it seems as though their minds are a little bit wild and untamed, that's natural for their age. But in another way, their understanding is better. They're, they're just easier to teach. Easier to teach. So, with that, I don't want you to lose confidence in your ability to hear the teaching. But maybe you can pick up a few clues from that. <laughs> the Buddha teaches us that we should never accept the path without discrimination. It's not that we're supposed to have a blind faith. It's not that we are supposed to mindlessly jump off a cliff. Because in that way we would never be able to really discern for ourselves whether the path that we were uh, walking on was truly the path that leads to enlightenment. We would never be able to discern for ourselves whether or not that path arises from the mind of enlightenment. And that we do have to discern. The Buddha recommends that we examine the teaching and examine the source. If the teaching comes from the mind of enlightenment, such as a, as a realized Buddha, an awakened being, such as Lord Buddha, uh, Guru Rinpoche, uh, uh, these that are Buddhas, we should realize that thereby that is the seed and the fruit accordingly 
should result in enlightenment, should be enlightenment. If the seed is enlightenment, if the seed source is enlightenment, the path that we travel on will also be the same as enlightenment and the result will be the same as enlightenment. But if we engage in something that seems to be spiritual but arises from another ordinary being who claims to have some kind of insight or uh, claims to have had a sense of realization or something like that but has not themselves uh, revealed themselves revealed themselves to be a Buddha in a way that we can be certain of. That is to say uh, they have not shown the signs. Uh, their bodies have not produced relics. They have not um, engaged in activity that has brought certain enlightenment to others, visible enlightenment to others, where they too have engaged, uh, have, have uh, revealed um, the sublime signs such as the bodies producing relics or the uh, rainbow phenomena at the time of death. We don't, if we don't know that, if we haven't seen that, we cannot be certain. We absolutely cannot be certain. So it, we may be following an ordinary sentient being. And in that case, if the seed is ordinary, then the fruit will also be ordinary. That is most certainly the case. Cannot get bananas from apple seeds. That will never happen. So we have to use discrimination in that way. But once we have found the path and we are on the path, that's not when you should discriminate. Because at that point, you will reserve judgment and you will not allow your mind to remain in the posture of a bowl. That bowl should be clean, without cracks, without poison at the bottom, the poison of judgment. It should not be turned over in the way that our minds are turned over when we cannot accept teaching. But the bowl should be right there, just like that. And that should be the way that our minds hold themselves. And that way the nectar can be poured in. We will not lose the nectar. So that's the posture that we're always trained to assume upon engaging in the teaching. And actually, in the beginning, uh, when I was first teaching some of the students who have been with me for some time now, I actually used to train them to hold their, their hands like that, just to think of a bowl. Not that the, not, there's not any amazing psychic metaphysical phenomena that's happening when you hold your hands like that. It's not that uh, your, your chakras are going to buzz and snap, crackle, pop, and all that kind of funny stuff. It's nothing like that at all. It's just that simply you can remind yourself to hold your mind like a bowl. And that's a good technique. It really teaches us something. It makes us remember. So at any rate, we as adults should hold ourselves in that posture. We should keep ourselves in that way. And maybe we can accomplish the path more surely and quickly without doubt. In that we are trying to accomplish the path, I would like to talk about some of the philosophical ideas that are contained within the path, that are uh, contained within the teaching that we have here. And the particular theme that I want to talk about today was actually inspired by one of our monks, our musical monk, Dorje Dreon. He wrote a song. And I forget the words. I wish I could quote the words correctly. You have all your words there, don't you? And I'm going to look them up. No, I think not. Uh, you look them up. <laughs> it was something about in this time when the Dharma is, you know, uh, in its final hour, uh, hold me to the path or something like that. Where is that? Ah, right. How long have I waited for your arrival? How long? Be firm with me, lest I hesitate in this the final hour of the diamond path. So therefore, that verse has inspired um, our class today. I was listening to you sing that yesterday during the performance, and I thought to myself, what an amazing thing that you have said. If only we could hear that. If only we could really understand that. How amazing it must be for a student to come to the path to find the path and realized that when we hear the teachings that this is the final hour of the path in the sense that while the Buddhist teaching has been around for a long time at least 2500 years that we can count and there are some different uh, opinions as to how long how long ago the actual traditional uh, Buddha that we think of when we say Buddha uh, Shakyamuni Buddha 
how long ago he actually lived. But let's say 2,500 years ago. These teachings have been propagated for 2,500 years. They have been kept purely. The teachings have never been lost. They have never gone underground. They have been kept word for word. There is an unbroken chain. And the teachings that were produced at that time produced other realized beings, beings who achieved the rainbow body, who had the signs and, and, and indications of enlightenment, who had uh, amazing powers, and, and even during the time of their life, and then at the time of their death, revealed the absolute certainty that they had attained realization through the miraculous events that transpired at the time of their death. So those teachings have produced many, many, not a few, not a handful, but many beings who have attained enlightenment. And then who have returned again and again in order to benefit sentient beings with the ability to do so and the inclination, the determination to do so. And during the course of the lives of these realized beings, they have revealed even further teachings, elaborations, not changes of the path, but elaborations, continuances, developments that were appropriate to the particular students that they were teaching and they spoke to the time. So there have been many miraculous things that have occurred. One of the bits of information that has come out during the course of time is that cyclic existence is just that, that it moves in cycles. That there is a cycle during which the Buddha first appears and that that cycle is very expansive. That during that time uh, life is, is in some ways much simpler and much easy, particularly to attain, when the Buddha first appears, it is much easier to attain enlightenment, the particular Buddha of that aeon, uh, such as Shakyamuni. That it's much easier to attain enlightenment, that the, the, the fabric of our mind streams, the actual karmic cause and effect uh, that, that uh, are contained within the flux of our mind streams, is much more expansive due to the virtue of the Buddha's appearance that one can achieve realization and it's even I've even been told, been told that during that time the Buddha would give some teaching and there are many stories of this the Buddha would give some teaching and suddenly uh, a being would attain arhathood which means that they would be move very close to enlightenment or even uh, a Buddha would give some blessing and suddenly the student would attain realization well myself and a lot of teachers that I've known and loved, and including uh, most of those who I consider to be uh, infinitely superior to myself, have been giving teachings for a very long time, and they've been giving empowerments, and, they've, and so far, nobody has turned into instant arhathood. And the reason why is because this time is different. It's not that the teachers have failed. It is that this time is different. There is an intermediate time in which uh, the Buddha has left, but the teachings are very strong. The teachings are absolutely uh, carried on by those who can remember the teachings uh, and those who can uh, memorize, who have memorized the teachings and can repeat them verbatim. Time progresses and now uh, then you see that uh, the teachings are written down and um, they are taught by those who are taught by those who are taught by those who have practiced the teachings and achieved some result. But they have no direct memory even though they are in an unbroken lineage of those who have been taught and have achieved some result. Still, there is no true memory of anyone who has actually seen the Buddha, the, the, the historical Buddha, alive and teaching like that, or even seen the Buddha's disciples. Time progresses, and during that time, uh, while there are those who still have practiced the teaching and achieved the result and passed that benefit on to their students, the time itself has changed. And now we find ourselves in a time that is considered to be a degenerate time. Degenerate in that the fabric of cause and effect relationship, and that includes, of course, the very fabric of our own mind stream, is extremely contracted. It is not expanded as it was when the historical Buddha walked on the earth. Now it is in one way much more difficult to achieve realization, extremely difficult to achieve realization. Uh, it never happens really now that one 
is with one's teacher, even if it is a relationship that is very pure in that one has extreme devotion for one's teacher, and the teacher has some realization, high realization, in fact. It really never happens that the te teacher st touches the student on the head and suddenly the student attains realization, or the teacher gives some potent nature of mind teaching, and suddenly the, te the student achieves realization. But there are those who are achieving realization even now, even as we speak. They do so, however, have with extensive retreat. Uh, they really have to work very hard at it. They have to take teachings, and they really have to accumulate many repetitions of mantra and prayer and accomplish puja. And they have to follow this very specific, very well laid out, very scientific, if you will, technology that the Buddha has laid out. And they have to follow it very clearly. They have to practice devotion to the nth degree. They really have to accomplish the bodhicitta, the great compassion. They really have to set themselves aside and renounce ordinary existence, whether they do it as a monk or nun, in which they, um, in an external way, renounce uh, cyclic existence, or whether they do it more in an internal way, from the heart and in the mind, not being hooked by cyclic existence, but being certain, stable, and unmovable in their minds. And in that way, practice renunciation. But renunciation must be practiced one way or the other. So one has to work very hard now. But there are those who are achieving realization. It is being done. It can be done. And in one way, in one way, the practice that leads us to enlightenment can be practiced very succinctly. And in one way, enlightenment can be practiced, can be accomplished more surely and more certainly than before. And here's the funny catch-22 situation that we find ourselves in. In this time of degeneration, karma, cause and effect relationships, which is really all that we are ever experiencing, is constant, interdependently arising cause and effect relationship. That's really all that we're ever experiencing, no matter what we experience. Our whole day is filled with that. Our lives, everything that we experience are made up of that. The content of our mind stream, these things are extremely condensed, contracted, and condensed. So in one regard, one doesn't have the natural quality of spaciousness to be able to practice very easily and very simply. It isn't just easy to sit down and just practice and achieve instant result. One does not have the spaciousness in one, one's mind to hear the teacher's teaching directly, to take it to heart, to internalize it, and in the spaciousness of one's natural state, of the, st of the stable mind, uh, truly accomplish the, the teaching. But since the mind stream is so condensed, and since cause and effect relationship karma are so condensed, karma actually ripens, ripens very quickly at this time. You may have actually noticed that, but not have known what you've noticed. Uh, there are some of us that have learned the teaching that, you know, basically if you are kind and loving and and uh, if you practice the bodhicitta toward other sentient beings, that it will make you happy. And conversely, if you are unkind, if you are selfish, if you are angry, that will come right back at you, that it will come back at you. In the time long ago that I'm speaking of, the time of expansion, when the Buddha first appeared on the earth, such karma would take lifetimes, at least, to come back at you. And it would be very hard in one way to learn the potency of the path. You could be very kind to sentient beings and never experience the merit of that, never experience the, the payoff on that for a very long time. And, and also you could be very uh, unkind to some other sentient beings. You could kill and never experience for many lifetimes what has ha you know, the, the result of that. And therefore not know, not really understand the horrible... Uh, um, uh, liability that you will experience due to killing or due to hurting in some way. Nowadays, however, that is not the case. In the same day, hasn't this happened to you? You can experience anger, you can be very unkind to someone, and in the same day, you can see it come right back at you. 
just turn the corner. You can almost, almost hear it go, Arr! you know, sort of like the Roadrunner cartoons. <laughs> you, can, you can hear it come right back at you and then boom, it's right in your face. The same lack of loving kindness that you showed to someone else is right there and you can, you can taste it. You can taste it. Your nose is being rubbed in it. Or you can see that a year ago, ten years ago, you, were, you can have a memory maybe of being unkind to one certain person and then that person will come back at you and bingo you get to eat some of that mothers are noticing that uh, the way that they conducted themselves toward their children is now coming back at, at them perhaps that is the seed perhaps that is the reason why now people are looking at psychology as a way to blame their parents for what they have done instant comeback instant karma it wasn't that way before. It really wasn't that way. If we kill bugs mindlessly, um, it may very well come about that the killing that we do, bugs, animals, if we are killers that kill other people, hopefully none of you are. <laughs> Don't pull out the chainsaw now, please. There are too many of us here. Um, if, if any of you engage in activity like that, you may notice uh, that uh, your life stream is, is that you're weak. There is a weakness. Uh, it's hard to find the statistics that actually prove this, and sometimes a thing will not ripen in this lifetime. It will, in fact, ripen in some subsequent lifetime. But, uh, you know, maybe we should take a survey. Um, Let's, let's check out the bug exterminators and find out, you know, do they develop sicknesses later on in life? Maybe we think it's due to the chemicals they've been exposed to, but maybe not. Maybe those who have participated in war and in killing uh, have some difficulty, some terrible difficulty due to the war. Is it due to the chemicals that they've seen? Is it due to the experience that they've had or the trauma? <coughs> or is it the karma of the situation? Nowadays, karma comes back much more quickly. The benefit here, and there is a benefit, there is a good news here in this, this thing that I've just told you, that is that the benefit of the practice comes back much more quickly, much more quickly. It used to be that one could practice and it would take endless lifetimes to achieve result, unless one were to practice in such a way that it really uh, uh, occurred just perfectly. The mind were stable, the mind were clear, and such as that, and without distraction. But now, if one practices really intently and with fervent devotion, and devotion is the key here, one can achieve the, the fruit, can eat the fruit of one's practice, if not during the course of one's life, then at the end of the life that at the intermediate state and the bardo state one can simply awaken to the nature by recognizing the fruits of one practice, if one's practice if one were to practice extensively the generation of the deity which is one of the practices that we practice here uh, one of the kinds of practice that we practice here then in that way uh, at the time of one's death when the buddha nature reveals itself to us as the elements dissolve one will perceive that buddha nature as the display of the deity and recognize that nature accordingly and that will be eating the fruit of one's practice having recognized that nature one will awaken and so the turnabout of one's practice can be accomplished much more easily now this particular practice that we teach here uh, is called Vajrayana and we are in the tradition of Vajrayana and particularly in the Nyingma school the Nyingma school is called the, uh, the school of the ancient ones. Nyingma means ancient ones. And uh, they are the first uh, the school of, of teaching, of revelation that first came out when Guru Rinpoche came to Tibet to deliver the path. But this particular uh, kind of teaching, this, va this path, this Vajrayana path, uh, Guru Rinpoche actually taught a portion of it while he was there in the physical body, but then when he left, he and his consort, Yeshit Sogyal, uh, buried many elements of the path, buried teachings in the future. 
He buried the teachings in the mind of his close disciples. He buried some of the teachings in water, and some of the teachings in rock, and some of the teachings in the air. And then he wrote down predictions. He gave predictions as to when those teachings would actually be revealed. Over time, all of those predictions have come true, every one of them. And every time a tertan or treasure revealer came to be born and actually revealed a cycle of teaching in the, in the perfect way that they did, uh, that teaching uh, was revealed according to prophecy. One could always look at prophecy. It was always prophesied that a certain tulku or reincarnate one would be born at a certain time and would reveal teaching in a certain way as in the instance of Tertin Migur Dorje, whose teachings we practice here. At the age of, I believe, nine, he gave his first indication, and at the age of twelve, he was revealing full-length Terima Revelation, that is to say, those books there, a whole cycle of them, many, many volumes of, of, of revelation, having within them how to practice the deity, the information on the deity, the way to accomplish uh, the very beginning Mundro, our preliminary practice, <coughs> through generation stage practice, all the way to the Dzogchen practice, the great completion practices. And he revealed them without flaw, even though he was not educated yet and could not read or write. He revealed them in that he saw the meditational deity appear from in the sky, and he would reveal volume after volume after volume flawlessly. And no change was needed. No modification of any kind was needed. His teacher would have to follow him around, even to the bathroom, because it was never known at what time he would simply see the deity and begin to spout the doctrine. And the teacher, basically at that point, was a secretary, had to write it down, write down the teaching, and catch every, every drop of the nectar. That child was prophesied. It was prophesied who he was the incarnation of and how he would appear and in what land and under what conditions. Often it is indicating what flowers will be blooming at that time. And that's how specific the prophecy is. And it always comes true just that way. At other times there have been indications that at a certain time out of a lake would be revealed a terima or a hidden teaching. And that a certain either dakini or a certain um, lama should be at that place at that time and then the, the teaching would be revealed. It would always coincidentally be that that Lama or that Dakini would be moved to go to a certain place at a certain time unknowing that they were the one, would have a dream or an insight or a knowing and at that point would gather at that lake where others had gathered knowing that something was going to happen and in the in the eyes of many some great uh, uh, marvelous, uh, sublime, um, ritual object or precious blessing object would come forth from the lake and just be held in the hands of that treasure revealer. So many things like that have happened. I've seen uh, such objects, uh, miraculous things, just miraculous things. And I, and I have seen the teachings that have been given in those miraculous ways. These teachings were revealed in just that way, and they were kept for, the, for this latter day time, meant to be revealed at a later date, long after the time of Guru Rinpoche. And even till this day, these teachings were held specifically for this time. In that, Vajrayana most greatly benefits people, sentient beings that are born in this degenerate aeon. The nature of the practice, the, the quality of the practice is such, the quality of the teaching is such that it is meant to be most auspicious, most functional, most beneficial during this time. There is something about the quality of Vajrayana. I've used this analogy many times. It seems to burn the candle at both ends. Uh, it, it, it is a, it is a, a practice that, uh, in which one... Um, uh, for instance, one of the qualities of the practice is often that while one practices renunciation, one practices it differently, specifically when one practices it as a layperson. Uh, but 
whether one is practicing it as a layperson as a, or as a nun, if one practices generation stage practice as is taught in the Vajrayana tradition, one does not suppress the uh, compulsion to consider oneself a self or an ego or to cling to the ego. One does not suppress it or deny it. You know, it's not, a, it's not a religion of suppression, you see. But one actually uses that inclination. One uses that energy. And there is, a, there is an energy associated with clinging to oneself as an ego that is a lot like a rubber band, you know. It's like uh, you can... You can you can um, think, you can not think of yourself as an ego, you can not, um, you can suppress that idea, you can try to think of something else, but it's almost like that however far out you stretch it, it will always come back to its original shape. That compulsion to, uh, to uh, consider self-nature as being inherently real is, is almost like a rubber band phenomenon. The same energy that the rubber band has that causes itself to reform, and so instantly, we have instinctively within our minds. Um, that idea of, of clinging to self-nature is so basic to our experience that all our experience is based on that idea. That is the first clause, that is the first thing, first cause of every experience that we have, kind of the center of the mandala of all of our experience and all of our thinking. So habitually, and that hab habit has been enforced through aeons and aeons of cyclic existence. Habitually, we come back to the same point again and again and again. Vajrayana actually uses that, interestingly, uses that in this way. That same inclination is used to practice generation stage practice. In generation stage practice, we actually meditate on shunyata, meditate on emptiness, meditate on the, the natural, uncontrived, primordial, state of emptiness, that sheer luminosity. Uh, we, we, we consider that all elements of perceptual uh, phenomena, all phenomena itself, is broken into its natural component, sheer luminosity without contrivance. And meditating on shunyata, we then use that impulse because that impulse will naturally happen after that point and then arise as the display of the primordial wisdom deity. And that same energy that causes us to consider self-nature, that same energy, that same tendency, is used to generate the deity. To the degree that we have that compulsion and that indication, to that degree, the strength of the generation will take place. Generating ourselves as the deity, we, in, we have... Uh, we, we generate that pure display having all of the pure qualities of the deity. Not having the qualities that we habitually have as ordinary sentient beings. We practice in, uh, in, um, um, encompassing the, the pure qualities of the deity. Arising from emptiness, we generate the bodhicitta. Arising from emptiness, we generate, um, even if it's a wrathful deity, we generate the wrathful display that is the cutting off of the ordinary ego, generate the, uh, the pristine nature, but in such a way as to be a, a phenomenal thing. It is a show, it is a display. It is visible to our eyes and our consciousness. And thinking in that way, we use the very energy that causes us to cling to self-nature to accomplish realization. Vajrayana has that unique quality. Can you see what I'm talking about when I say that it burns the candle at both ends? Uh, we, 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 we use what we have, that fire, that passion, even the desire, even the ego. We use what we have to accomplish the primordial wisdom nature rather than engaging in suppression. Oh, we have many different kinds of meditation. We have just sitting. We have vipassana meditation. Uh, we have shine meditation. We have the uh, kind of meditation in which one simply... Um, uh, uh, narrows the focus into one specific kind of thing, such as the image of the Buddha, or one uh, simply watches the breath. But the, the really, the, the backbone of Vajrayana practice is generation stage practice, so important. Now we are in this time of degeneration. Now we are in this time that uh, Dorje spoke of, uh, a time when 
um, the, uh, the karma, cause and effect, the content of our mind stream uh, is so condensed that we can really take advantage of this path. But on the other hand, we are coming close to the next phase and the next phase that I've spoken of, which comes after the appearance of the Buddha, after the intermediate times, and after this time, which is the time when, actually this is the time when the Buddha's teaching is becoming misused and false, false teachers actually arise. Those that claim to be incarnations of the Buddha or expressions of the Buddha or some craziness like that, although they are not, and they claim to simply have the answer because they have been the Buddha in the past or you know, funny things like that are starting to happen. So in this time of degeneration, uh, that false teaching has arisen. And now the next time, and that will come sometime in the future, will be the time when the bodhisattvas stop incarnating. That the karma of the, of the uh, general population becomes so condensed and so tight that there is no space, there is no appearance that can actually happen. And then I am taught that eventually there will be a time where there is no teaching on the world. No teaching that can bring us to enlightenment. There will be lots of different kinds of teaching, but no teaching that can bring us to enlightenment. There will be no path. There will be no um, bodhisattvas that incarnate. And the Buddha will not be present in the world. A time of great darkness, and there will be wars. And finally, that will be a time of, of night, of darkness. And immediately after that, the Buddha appears again. So now we are at a time when things are becoming much more condensed, much more closed, and darker, actually. But during this time, one has a window, one has a shot. Things are lining up so that if one were to practice sincerely now, and to practice, practice an actual technology that can lead to enlightenment, that has led to enlightenment, and has brought disciples repeatedly to enlightenment, if one were to practice that with fervent regard, with strong devotion, with faith, in a pristine and pure way, an undefiled way, then one could achieve the auspicious result. One could achieve uh, either realization during the course of this lifetime or in the intermediate or, bar or, ba or bardo state or, or, ch or achieve the auspicious rebirth that we want to achieve in order to practice purely, in order to practice perfectly, and then achieve the perfect result. One can accomplish that in this lifetime, but for how long? For how long? If we think, oh, you know, this is a lifetime in which I'd like to have some blessing, I'd like to achieve some merit, I'd like to do something, you know, but maybe, I don't know, I'm not set up for it. I'm not the kind of person that really wants to do that. I don't know. Things are just too much fun right now. And maybe later, maybe later. The maybe later for that philosophy is you must have known, but you must see it by now. It's baloney. Have you ever tried maybe later? You know what happens to maybe later? Maybe later never comes, and then you get old, and then you die. That's what happens to maybe later. And then you think maybe next lifetime. Maybe this is not the life for me. Personality-wise, I'm just not cut out for it. Maybe this is not what I'm supposed to be doing now. That's a bad gamble to take. I would not want to take the game gamble of maybe next lifetime. Because one never knows what karma will ripen in the bardo. One never knows what karma is lurking beneath the surface of one's own mind stream. Maybe later you're going to be a frog. You know, maybe later you're not going to be in any position to practice anything at any time even those who have achieved the auspicious result of being human, humans who can practice the path. How many can, really? How many have actually seen the path and have the auspicious occasion by which to take the path? So how amazing it must be for a student, such as uh, having the experience such as Dorje has voiced, to come to the path, to have everything line up, to have a teacher that you can relate to, that you can understand, who can give you the path, who can uh, uh, provide for you the necessary components of the path and the blessings, and, and uh, to teach a path that brings the auspicious result. And to be able to, to, for one's consciousness, to be able to contain it. There's nothing defective about oneself. When, when, you know, Dorji finds that he is intelligent. Dorji finds that he can make a decision. 
Dorji finds that he can practice. Dorji finds that he has faith and that he has devotion. Dorji and anyone like him would be a fool not to take full advantage of it, to actually practice the technology. Not just to talk about it, not just to be on the periphery, you know, not just to be a peripheral practitioner, sort of out there somewhere, not just to hear it and go away thinking, wow, pretty neat. Not just to be affected by it. That's, who cares? Practice it. Practice it. That's the difference. The technology is the difference. He would be a fool not to take full advantage. We would all be fools not to take full advantage. How ridiculous. In this time, when the Dharma can really bring fruit in some amazing way that ripens so quickly, in this time when it is almost too late, this is the time that we should take advantage of. No better time than this. There is no better time than this. Particularly to meet with the path, this Vajrayana path that has some specific element that is meant for this time. Meant to bring the benefit of this time. How astonishing that we have come to this point and how ridiculous not to take advantage. <clears throat> how many times have you found yourself during the course of your life being faced with some bountiful feast of one kind or another and find yourself taking the posture of being a peasant eating only the crumbs of that feast? Haven't you done that to yourself before? Haven't you experienced something wonderful or beautiful and not taken full advantage of it? Such as in a love relationship, for instance. Perhaps love was held out to you and you didn't take it. Why? Because you didn't know. You didn't have the habit of it. You didn't know how to. Didn't have the skill. Didn't think you were worthy. Just couldn't make yourself move forward. Or maybe you had some opportunity to take a career move or, or something very mundane like that and you were not able to really take advantage of it. How many times, how many times have we made that kind of mistake? You know you have the habit of it. You know that you do. How many times have you missed out because you didn't know how to take a hold? You found yourself dancing on the sidelines, just holding back, just not knowing how to take advantage. How many countless times have you done that to yourself? made yourself a beggar, a pauper, in the midst of a bountiful feast. And isn't that what's happening now? Aren't we doing that again? Aren't we in the midst of a feast, a bountiful feast, by which we can actually help ourselves? We hold this feast in our hands, a precious jewel, that it takes endless lifetimes to find. Endless lifetimes to find an unbelievable ripening of cause and effect relationships to find this precious jewel. And now we hold it in our hands and we just go, don't know what to do. We just sort of look around and we don't know what to do. We have the habit of not knowing what to do. We can't help ourselves. So maybe that's why I nag you so much. Help yourself. Take a hold of it. Use it. This is a precious time. It can work for you now. You're standing at the threshold of the door of liberation, looking at the very deliverance, looking at the very mind of liberation, looking at the very nature of liberation. You look at the very face of Guru Rinpoche. You look at that every day. You see that Guru Rinpoche is touching you in your life. Lord Buddha is touching you in your life. That nature is revealed to you and you cannot see it because you have the habit of being a beggar at a feast. <coughs> you have to stop that now. You have to wake up. You have to get a hold of yourself and take yourself by the hand as though you were your own best friend or your own mother. And as though you were your own mother, teach yourself how to eat. Teach yourself won't feel right to you at first. You don't know how to work hard spiritually. You don't know how to do that. You don't know how to do what's good for you. You want to do what seems to be the best thing. And what seems to be the best thing is to do what you're used to. Hang out under the table of the banquet and open your mouth trying to catch a few crumbs. 
That's what feels natural for you. That's what feels good because you're used to it. But instead you must take a hold of it. Sit at the table like the king or queen that you are and eat the feast. If it is yours, if you can do it, eat the feast. There will be no better time. This is the best time for it. All of the auspicious circumstances are lining up for you. It doesn't get any better than this or any easier in one way. And you have somehow miraculously met with the path that produces the auspicious result. Take advantage of it. Allow yourself to experience what Dorje experiences when he expresses the joy. How could I not take advantage of this? How could I not see what a blissful encounter this actually is? And I think it is in that same song that it is expressed the thought uh, th that he asked the teacher, you know, be hard on me. Take me by the scruff of the ne neck, basically, I'm paraphrasing, of course, and shake me into it, you know, be hard on me. Don't let me get away with it. Take me, lest I forget to be the king that I am. So that's our teaching for today, and I hope, hope that it is beneficial to you. Please use it. If you don't use it, it's useless. It's a relatively inexpensive and relatively unimpressive entertainment. <laughs> You'd do better to go see a movie. Please take advantage of it. When I say something to this, like this to you, it's with the idea, the concept of concern for the well-being of sentient beings for you, that you can take advantage of this opportunity. You can do what you can to benefit yourself. And also, so that you can accomplish that ultimate compassion I was talking about to the children by yourselves becoming bodhisattvas or Buddhas, so that you can return again and again and again for the others. I'm only speaking to you. I and other lamas cannot find the way to speak to the others who do not have the karma to hear about the path. But someday, you will. There are many that you have connection with that I have no connection with. Many that you have connection with that other lamas do not have connection with. Maybe they're animals now. Maybe they are people. Maybe they are non-physical at this time and they're not even here to, to hear it. But in some future life, those that you have karma with will come to that moment and you will be their only hope. They will have hopes of you. Will you be ready? Or will you have missed the brass ring? That's the other reason why I'm trying to make you hear this. For their sake. It's kind of like casting a great net out into the ocean of suffering and bringing them up lifetime after lifetime. How magnificent. How perfect. Thank you for coming today. Thank you for listening. Again, please try to use, uh, if you wish to practice, if you wish to learn how to practice, uh, the way is made clear. Start with a seven-line prayer. Come and receive teachings on how to practice preliminary practice. And begin now before it's too late. so much for joining t tonight and um, every time you do <laughs> uh, we're always so happy to to be sharing these and um, to have you here 
Um, in addition to Wednesday nights, we do show them again at Sundays at 11 a.m. Um, also on YouTube, and because they're pre-recorded, they're also um, uh, what do I want to say archived on the on YouTube um, itself. So always you can go back and see see these. Um, in addition, we have um, we offer here the temple is now open. I, I just I'm, I always forget to start with that. Um, I'm so excited. Um, <laughs> the temple is now open all, um, all day, basically, from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. daily, the inside, the prayer room. And um, so you can come in the south door and go so you can go directly into the prayer room, and that will, that's open for you. In addition, the outside is, is open dawn to dusk, which is pretty close, but, you know, a little extra time in the morning. Um, and invite you to come and walk the land and and you know be with the stupas and the statues and the um the energy and the and the animals out back who are just precious beyond belief um and to you know enjoy the prayer room and the, and the practices you are invited to any practices that we do inside and um you know as well as um online so we're, we're continuing them online um, to reach as many people as we can um, uh, in addition so Sunday uh, so Saturdays and Sundays we have a 10 a.m. meditation that's in person in the prayer room or on YouTube uh, we have medicine Buddha which is basically a very short condensed or or um, simple practice every evening at 7 p.m. and that is on Facebook um, it's not actually generated from inside the temple always. It might be sometimes, um, but I don't know when, so hard to tell. Um, let's see. We have food offering, which is a soak and brings about tremendous amounts of merit, which can help push you forward on this. And that is um, offered basically every day, um, Monday through uh, Monday. Monday through Friday is at 5.30, with the exception of Thursday at 5. So it's it, right around that time frame. Saturdays at noon, Sundays at 2, which is actually separate. It's um, uh, th Those others are all available on Zoom, in addition to being in person. And um, the Sunday one is in person live at the Guru Rinpoche statue. And when we can, you know, get some good internet, which has been most of the time now, um, we, uh, you can get it on Facebook. So, um, sun, uh, Sundays also after that soak, often we have a drum circle live um, at the Guru Rinpoche statue at 4 p.m. where we're, um, we're drumming for rain. You know, trying to bring about rain and rebalance this planet in one way, anyway. And uh, so far, I've been getting a lot more rain. So hopefully, that's working. It's, uh, but the and the drum circles are great fun. If you don't have a drum, you um, can probably we have some extras, or you can just chant along because we're chanting the Tara mantra, I believe, mostly, and um, possibly also the Mani mantra. So. Um, easy mantras to do, people all there to help you, a lot of fun. Um, and so come and check it out. Uh, the announcements for all of that are on basically on social media, on Facebook and Instagram, on the, on the KPC, um, uh, KPC channels there everywhere. So, um, so that's where you can find out, you know, if it is or if it isn't as well as on Tara.org, our website. So um, we offer you all of those options, and we hope you take them. Meanwhile, if you want to make an offering to Jetsima, um, you can do so at any time, jetsimagift at gmail.com. That's jetsimagift at gmail.com is the uh, PayPal address. So you can send it to her directly through that. and um, and that helps strengthen your connection and uh, probably also gets you involved in a whole lot of merit because most of Jetsima's money goes to straight to feeding people. So that's uh, pretty amazing to watch and be part of. Anyway, 
we're really glad to have you here. We hope you come back often and um, please don't hesitate to get in touch with us if you have any questions at all. Um, KPC at Tara.org is the main email and based on your question, it'll be directed to someone who can give you the best answer. So um, hope to hear from you, hope to see you come often. There's lots of volunteer opportunities and you know, there's also just lots of opportunities to just refresh yourself and um, connect with the spiritual practices. So good to see you now. See you next time. Thank you.